الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله So, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله So to continue on إن شاء الله this, uh, this chapter is a very important chapter because he clarifies a lot of or rather a section within the, the book it's a chapter within the book of knowledge um, so one of the things that he says, he actually begins uh, this book by with a hadith from Imam al-Bayhaqi and also Ibn Abd al-Barr mentions it. So in light of your, some of you attended the Qigong session, the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have said, اُطُّبْ الْعِلْمُ وَلَوْ You know, seek knowledge even, وَلَوْ uh, بِالصِّينَ Seek knowledge even to China. And uh, the... The ulama, they said that hikmatu nazarat ala tharatha. Wisdom has descended upon three civilizations. The aid ahl al the hands of the, the Chinese, wa admiqat al and the intellects of the Greeks, but really it's the, that whole beginning in India, because the Greeks are actually uh, part of the Indo-European. Wa al al-Arab, and the tongues of the Arabs. <laughs> so uh, he mentions that hadith because the uh, the Muslims they they took knowledge they were very uh, syncretic in their approach to knowledge if they found knowledge that was useful or beneficial they would take that knowledge where they found it so if they they borrowed from Greek medicine they borrowed from Chinese medicine they borrowed from uh, Ayurvedic medicine they also developed their own theories about medicine and uh, they certainly borrowed from Greek uh, logic they also there's influence from the Nagarjuna logic as well you can see some of the influence in the Ash'ari uh, positions that are clearly taken out of Buddhist uh, tradition a lot of the Buddhist logicians from Balkh and Harat and these great Buddhist centers that were in Afghanistan they became Muslim and so they brought a lot of their uh, their tools with them into the religion. And and the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Al-Hikmatu Dalatul Mu'min. The wisdom is the is the lost property of a believer, so wherever he finds it, he has more right to that. So uh, he mentions one of the things that he does in here is he talks about the fact that the fuqaha He says the fuqaha are, they're really people of worldly knowledge. In fact, one of the things that he says in this very chapter, he says, وَقَدْ كَانَ سُفْيَانَ الثَّوْرِ وَهُوَ إِمَامٌ فِي عِلْمَ الظَّاهِرِ يَقُولُ إِنَّ طَرَبَ هَذَا لَيْسَ مِنْ زَادَ الْآخِرَةِ سُفْيَانَ الثَّوْرِ, one of the great fuqaha and mushtahid mutlaq, he was an independent jurist, had his own madhab. He said that seeking this knowledge is not provision for the akhirah. And, and part of the reason that he said that, and Imam al-Ghazali elaborates considerably, but part of the reason he said that is because that fiqh or jurisprudence was something that enabled you to get jobs in the government, it enables you to become a qadi, a judge. There were a lot of societal perks, perquisites for learning it and studying it. And so the fuqaha, the jurists, then had a lot of pitfalls that were very difficult to avoid. And he goes into that, but 
what he says, he said, وَمَنْ تَعَلَّمْ This is Imam al-Ghazali. وَمَنْ تَعَلَّمْ هَذِهِ الْأُمُورَ لِيَتَقَرَّبِ بِتَعَاطِيهَا إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فَهُوَ مَجْنُونَ If you learn these fiqh or jurisprudence, and he's not talking about your ibadah, he's really talking about all of the, the fard kifaya, the collective obligations that enable people to become judges. He said, if you learn that as a way to draw near to God, then you're mad. Whoever does that is mad. This was the reason, this statement, there's another statement also, but this was one of the primary reasons why they burnt the book in Andalusia during his lifetime. It was literally burnt publicly. It wasn't the best of times for uh, difference of opinion. The Andrusians were uh, very, very staunch Maliki. They were also Athari. They were not Ashari at that time. In fact, they, the, the Western Islam adopts the Ashari creed because of one of the students of Imam al-Ghazali, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi. Also, Ibn Turmud, who was... He's a problematic figure, but he also had some uh, influence in that. So, this, that's what he said. He said, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَلُ بِالْقَلْبِ وَالْجَوَارِحِ فِي الطَّاعَاتِ وَشَرَفُ هُوَ عِلْمُ تِرْكَ الْعَمَالِ What will get you near to God is, is those things, the actions that are going to purify your heart and obedience of your limbs and the honor of that that is, that's the real honor. So he says, if you say, and this is one of his techniques in the book, he preempts his critics. So he will say, فَإِنْ قُلْتْ You might disagree and say, how can you put fiqh and medicine, jurisprudence and medicine at the same level? Because he earlier says that medicine is a worldly science also. And then, so he says, when we know that medicine is for the health of the body, w uh, uh, and whereas fiqh, jurisprudence, is for the health of the, the soul. So he says, I'm not equating them. It's not a necessary equation. There's definitely a difference between them. Jurisprudence is more honorable. And he gives reasons for it. For instance, it's a, it's a sacred science, although medicine has a sacred component to it, certainly. And he considered it to be from the fara'id al-kifaya, a collective obligation. But he's saying that the Prophet did not come as a healer of the bodies. Ibn Khaldun in the Muqaddimah says, the Prophet didn't come to teach us medicine, but he, he brought the principles of medicine. In fact, in the verse in the Quran, uh, eat and drink but not to excess one of the Greek physicians in Alexandria I think or one of the Egyptian towns when he heard that he said ما ترك نبيك I mean it's from the Quran but he said ما ترك نبيك شيئا لجالينوس you know that your prophet didn't leave anything for Galen because so much of sickness is from overeating, taking more calories than you need. So when it says eat and drink but not to excess, if, if, you, if you're not excessive in your food and drink, then your body will be healthy. So he says that, um, that fiqh, the second reason that it's more honorable, is that people that are seeking the next world have to have ways of doing that. Whereas medicine is something that the only people that need it are the sick people. If you're healthy, and there's people that go through life, they don't ever need a doctor. I mean, there are many places where there aren't doctors. I've, I've lived in places where there's no doctors. Tuaymarat uh, in Mauritania in the Sahara. If you got sick, you either died or you got well. There's no 911 or... No ambulance is going to come get you. And unfortunately, in a lot of places, simply because they don't know about massaging the fundus and things after childbirth, women bleed out and die from things that are easily remedied with a little bit of midwifery and knowledge. So, uh, so he says that you don't need a, a doctor except the sick people, whereas with fiqh, you, you, you need it. Whether, whether you're sick or well, you need to know 
uh, how to behave. And then he says, and the third reason is that um, fiqh really is a the outward fiqh is necessary and complements the inward fiqh, which is the purpose. And this is why tasawwuf, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, who I mentioned yesterday, tasawwuf was traditionally considered fiqh al-batan. Just like you have fiqh al-zahir, they considered tasawwuf to be fiqh al-batan. It was simply the fiqh of the internal states, just as the jurisprudence is the fiqh of the outward states. It's the jurisprudence of your outward states. So you need to know, uh, for instance, if you're going to get married, what are the arkan of marriage? What are, the, what are the foundations of it? You have to have, obviously, you have to have the, the, the male and the female, so that's important. Um, I mean, some people would debate that today, but um, in our tradition, you have to have the male and the female, and then you have to have uh, the wali, according to the three, Abu Hanifa allows for certain women to um, take care of their own, they can be their own wali. You have to have a sadaq, there has to be some type of exchange. You have to have the siga. you have to have some type of marriage ceremony in which one uh, says, the wali says, I give, give this woman in marriage to you, and the man says, qabilta, I accept it. So you have to have that. And then you have to have witnesses. So that's the fiqh. But what do you do when there's problems in the marriage? What do you do when there's the hearts aren't right in the marriage? The faqih can't do a whole lot there. He can tell you, okay, here's the haq and here's... But if the woman is always harassing the husband or the husband is violent with the woman, the faqih can say, يَحْرُمُ عَلَيْكَ ضَرْبُهَا It's prohibited to strike her. He probably knows that already, maybe not, because unfortunately some Muslims are under the mistaken assumption that somehow domestic violence is their prerogative as a male. But no faqih has ever said that in the history of Islam. It's not permitted to be violent with women. You can't hit an animal. Uh, in, in any way that would harm the animal. So, it's not really conducive to love in a relationship. Um, so, what happens though when his anger is like that? Well, there you need, you know, لَيْسَ هَذَا طُبُّ جَالِي نُوسُ وَإِنَّمَا يَخْتَصُ بِالنَّفُوسِ This isn't the medicine of Galen, this is psychology. So now you need the psychologist, which is traditionally what the, 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 the sheikh or the murabbi was. He was basically what we would call today a psychologist. And so that knowledge was very important to understand the nafs, the nature. For instance, Imam al-Ghazali says in another part in the Ihya about raising children, he said nobody should raise children that is unaware of the temperament of children. Because human beings have temperament, and this was what you were given. Now, the best people are balanced people, but most people have, in traditional medicine, they have temperaments. So they have too excessive heat, or they have excessive coldness, or, they're, or they're, they're, they're hot or wet. And so those imbalances in, in what were called traditionally the akhlaq or the humors, I mean, a lot of people don't accept this anymore, but whether or not the humors are actual substances like black bile and yellow bile and blood and, and collar and, uh, and phlegm, right? whether these are, are accurate descriptions or not, most modern physicians would reject them. But the reality of the temperaments is real. In fact, the Myers-Briggs personality assessments correspond very closely with these traditional and ancient temperaments. Ibn Sina developed the psychology of the temperaments uh, 
far beyond what Galen um, had done. So Imam al-Ghazali says it's important to know that, to know the temperament of a child, because if you're choleric, Safrawi, you're going to be inclined to get angry easier because you're hot and you're dry. And foods that are hot and dry are going to exacerbate your symptoms. And so there's a way to treat that just in, just in diet. There's a way to treat it uh, also in knowledge of self-knowledge, knowing that people get angry easier than other people. The Saudawi, which is a melancholic personality, is, is, is cold and dry. And these are people that incline towards uh, depression. Their anger tends to go inward as opposed to outward. The choleric, and they're related, the choleric and the melancholic. But the choleric will express it outwardly, uh, inwardly. Whereas the, the choleric will express it outwardly, the melancholic inwardly. So knowing that about yourself, that you incline towards a melancholic temperament, will help in understanding why, for instance, certain things affect you. If your spouse has that temperament, then that helps a lot to understand that because you need to treat them in a different way. A sanguine temperament, which is hot and wet, um, and that temperament is, uh, they're not affected by things. They, they, they're, they're like water off the back. They're, very, they're more cheerful, that we call it sanguine. These are, these are words that are still remnants of this tradition in Western civilization. You know, a phlegmatic person, a melancholic person, uh, he, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's got a lot of bile. I mean, that's the choleric personality. And then sanguine means cheerful. So these, and, and then people have underlying, they, they have a dominant temperament, they have an underlying temperament. That's a very useful knowledge, Imam al-Ghazali says, to know the personality. So teachers should know what they're dealing with, with their students. Because how you treat them is going to affect them. Uh, what you say to a melancholic person will, might have a far more uh, lasting impression than say to a sanguine person. You can you actually harm them without knowing. And I heard Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya once say that أَكْثَرُ الْمَشَاكِلِ فِي الْعَالَمِ amzija. Most of the world's problems are a result of temperament. Just people's temperaments, because they don't understand themselves. So you have all these people out there that are just angry. They don't understand that they've actually got a temperament problem. You know, like we have children that have temper tantrums. We've got all these adults ha that have temper tantrums. You know, road rage is, is clearly choleric personality. Not everybody will do that, but a choleric person will do that. And if they understand that, then you can get to anger management, because choleric people need anger management. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us anger management. He said, for instance, Allah him, if you get angry and you're standing up, sit down. Right? Because it's heat. Heat rises, so go against it. He said, if you're still angry, lie down. And then another time he said, go and do wudu. Like put water on yourself to calm yourself down. So if you're in the midst of an argument, you shouldn't be arguing, but if you're in the midst of an argument and you're standing up, sit down. If that still doesn't work, lie down. It'll end the argument, I guarantee you. The guy will think you're nuts and he'll walk away. <laughs> But people need to practice these things, really, if they want to overcome their, their selves. So, oh, you know, I haven't read this for a while, so very next sentence. I really didn't know that was coming. MashaAllah. <laughs> As for sickness and health, these are attributes of temperament and humors. So it's the nature of the, it's the influence because we believe in a hylomorphic body. You know, we, we actually believe that the body and the soul, we're not, we're not Cartesian. We don't believe in this separation uh, of the ghost in the machine. We actually believe that there is a profound relationship, which is why our worship is in the body. This is why we believe in the bodily resurrection. So the, the body is very important to us. And taking care of the body is important to us. And the body will affect the soul, and the soul in turn also will affect the body. So this, these are important uh, points about that. So that's what he's saying. So he says, فَمَهْمَ أُضِيفَ الْفِقْهُ إِلَى الطِّبْ ظَهَرَ شَرَفُهُ So when 
this fiqh is added to medicine, you will see even more sharaf, more honor. وَإِذَا أُضِيفُ عِلْمُ الطَّرِيقَ الْآخِرَةِ إِلَى الْفِقْهِ ذَهَرَ أَيْضًا شَرَفُ عِلْمُ الطَّرِيقَ الْآخِرَةِ And if you add knowledge of the next world to fiqh, then you will see even more. And this is why traditionally the, the ulama were also doctors. They studied the humors, they understood people, they, they studied psychology. It was very important uh, for them to understand uh, the nature. Much of the sickness that we see today, the depression that people have, is because they, they're too, they're, they're connected to all these machines all the time, and which are having a negative effect on people. And because, don't forget, those are radiation, they're literally the, the bat, there's vibrations coming out, they're, they're affecting the brain, and the brain synchronizes with them. Um, and then people don't go out in nature anymore. They don't look at nature. They don't experience nature. They don't breathe properly. They don't exercise. All of these things have a result, have a, an effect on us. And so a lot of people are actually very depressed simply because they're, they're not taking care of their bodies. There's a lot of people sick for that reason. And that's why it's very important in our tradition to take care of the body. The Prophet ﷺ, in fact, in, in Imam Dhahabi's Tabba Nabawi, he says that in one riwayah it said that his kitchen was like an apothecary because he had so many uh, herbs and different things brewing at different times. And, and Aisha was asked, how did you learn knowledge of medicine? Her cousin asked him, her, how did you learn this knowledge of medicine so adeptly? And she said, I used to listen to the conversations of the Prophet ﷺ with the physicians. And we have an amazing hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, a man came to him and complained of his chest. And the Prophet put his hand on his chest and he said, Innaka maf'ud, you've got some heart disease. And he said, Ilhaq bil harath al karada go to al harath al karada because innahu yatatabab, because he's a physician. So that's an example of the Prophet doing literally like a diagnostic scanning with his hand وسلم, and then giving a reference referring him to a specialist. Amazing hadith. But Aisha radiallahu knew medicine very well and the Prophet وسلم, gave us very profound uh, medical advice and there are uh, hadith indicating that people should move Sayyidina Omar said, قِلَّةُ الْحَرَكَةَ تَعْقِلِ الْبَدَنِ Not moving enough will create blockage in the body. And he said also, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Omar رضي الله عنه said, لَا تَرْمُ النُّخَارَ فَإِنَّهَا مِنَ الطَّعَامِ Don't throw the bran away, the fiber, because it's part of the food. Refined food, in other words. What people eat today, they're sick. We get all these diseases that they don't need. The Prophet ﷺ said one of the signs of the end of time is he said, Tadhar al bawasir You will see uh, hemorrhoids widespread. Why? That's not a disease of uh, uh, places where people move a lot. It's a disease of stagnation, where people are sitting too much, where they're not actually moving, they're not actually uh, involved. So th it's very important to remember those things, that this is part of being well in your body. Your body has rights over you. Your body has a right over you to take care of it, to exercise it. Um, and it should last, you know, if you take care of it. People, you know, it's amazing, like people, they eat terribly, they never exercise, and then they get a disease that is a result of their lifestyle and then qadrullah ma sha and fa'al you know mashallah ibtila you know that this is the way they look at it this is ibtila from god no it's a ibtila from your lifestyle the way that you have lived has resulted in this don't don't blame god right take care of yourself and then if you're doing all the things that you should be doing and you still get that then that's a ibtila. <laughs> but if you're not taking care of yourself, don't blame anybody but yourself. So then he says, now here's, this is really important because we're getting to the... فَإِنْ قُدْتَ فَصِّلْ لِي 
علم طريق الآخرة تفصيلا clarify to me in detail what is this path of the Akhirah that you're talking about فَعْلَمْ أَنُّهُ قِسْمًا Know that it has two categories. علم مكاشفة وعلم معاملة In the translation he interprets it as the knowledge of revelation, which is not that. It's, it's the knowledge of unveiling or inspiration that comes. مكاشفة is the unveilings that occur to the heart. That These are تجليات. And the second is علم معاملة. So the first category, ilm al-mukashifa, is the knowledge of the inward, ilm al-batan. It's the knowledge of the inward. وَذَلِكَ غَايَةَ الْعُلُومِ This is really the aim and purpose of all knowledges. All sciences, the aim and purpose of them is to understand the inward realities. These are the first causes. This is what uh, true understanding is to understand the first causes behind things. And the first causes are never outward. They're, 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 they're metaphysical truths that are behind the outward. And then he says, some of the arifin, some of the, th these people of this knowledge of ma'rifa, they say, مَن لَمْ يَكُونْ لَهُ نَصِيبٌ مِنْ هَذَا الْعِلْمِ أَخَافُ عَلَيْهِ سُوَى الْخَاتِمَةِ If you don't have a portion of this knowledge, I fear for you a bad ending in your life. So what does he say about this? Very interesting. وَقَالَ آخِرُ He says, وَأَدْنَى نَصِيب مِنْهُ التَّصْدِيقُ بِهِ وَتَسْلِيمُهُ لِأَهْلِهِ The least portion of this knowledge is that you believe in it and its people. That there's people that have this knowledge. If you reject the awliya, right? Bad, bad sign. أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهُ لَا خَوْنَ عَلَيْهُمْ وَلَهُمْ يَحْسُنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ There are maratib, degrees of wilaya. There are degrees of wilaya. And wilaya is the special providence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given His entire creation providential care. All of His creation has providential care. Obviously, free will... Uh, has an effect and so you see a lot of evil and you see these horrible things but it it's it's not a sign that Allah's providential care isn't there no his providential care is there that providential care though has degrees and if you want more articulation of this you can look at an essay that I wrote in uh, in the uh, Nasiri about that Allah's love is for his entire creation. His love is for the whole of creation. And this is from Amir Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, who relates it to other scholars' understandings. That this idea that God hates some of his creation, no. He has a mahabba amma and then a mahabba khasa. So when you see verses like, in Allah la yuhibba al-dhalimeen, Allah doesn't love the oppressors. They don't get his mahabba khasa, they get the mahabba amma, there, there's bug, because Allah hates, but not in a, a, you can't look at it in an anthropomorphic way, like it's emotion, you know, that God's petulant, and that he has love like we have love. That's a big mistake to do that. But Allah has created a creation out of his rahmah. And so to deny that rahmat, no. Rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. My mercy encompasses all things. And rahmah is from mahabba. Allah's mahabba encompasses all things. All things. But that specific love is for the people of wilaya. And that love intensifies with the intensity of the wilaya. And so as people draw near to Allah with Iktisab, and this is important to note because Nubuwa is ghayr muktasaba, but the Prophet ﷺ has wilaya and Nubuwa. He has both. He's wilaya, because people will say, well, how is the Prophet special if Allah chose him? It wasn't a choice. He has Nubuwa, and it was just given to him, and there's nothing that he can do about that, right? It's just given. He's ma'asum, he can't make mistakes. But he has wilaya. The Prophet ﷺ has, and that's why he said when, when his feet swelled,
from ibadah. And they said, the Aisha radiallahu said, Allah has forgiven you what went before and what went after it, and you're staying up so much in prayer at the night he was older that he was getting what they call venous stasis. So his, his, uh, his, his feet were getting swollen from this. And, and he said, oh, shouldn't I be a grateful slave? See, that's his wilaya. Like he's acting, from, this is from him, this is his free will. The Prophet's free will is in the cho choosing of the good that he has. And so his nubuwa and his wilaya, every Prophet is a wali. But not every wali is a Prophet. Right? And this is why the Prophet is over all, that one Prophet is better than all the awliya. So the Prophet is, he's rising in those degrees. And this is why, for instance, Musa السلام, he got angry, he broke the Torah when he threw down, sorry, the Ten Commandments, when he threw it down. Right? When, when that anger left, he picked them up again. But he was angry because he was a human being. So the prophets get angry, they have these human things, but they also, they develop themselves in their lives here on earth while they're here. Their knowledges differ. At the, their knowledge at the beginning is not the same as the knowledge of the end. Qad Ayyab, for instance, says about the Prophet, when somebody said to him, Sayyiduna, he said, Bal Sayyidukum Ibrahim. No, your Sayyid is Ibrahim. He didn't know yet that he was over Ibrahim. Uh, that's one opinion about that. Because he's, Ana Sayyidu wal di Adam wa la fakhar. I'm the Sayyid of all of the, uh, of the children of Adam and I'm not boasting. In other words, I'm commanded just to let you know this is my maqam. His maqam is over his father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So there's an example of, uh, of that. This is the inward realities. And this is what Mukashiva is concerned with for the awliya. And so he's saying the least that you should have is a belief in awliya. And every tradition has had these people. Every tradition that, that came from God, you will see that they had these people. And the early Christians had many, many miracles. People saw them with their own eyes. They had the gift of healing. Uh, they could lay on hands. People would be healed. Uh, they did miraculous things. This is well recorded, documented. Um, and we know that there were miracles of the Jewish. The Prophet ﷺ gave us many examples of miracles that occurred at the hands of Jewish people. وَثْبِتًا لِلْأَوْلِيَدْ كَرَامَةً وَمَنْ نَفَاهَ فَمْبِذًا كَرَامَةً Imam al laqani says in the Johara that assert the, the miracles of the saints and whoever rejects them, reject him. Because it's, it's, uh, they're real. So you should at least believe in them and, and then uh, recognize that they're, they're real. And then another one said, you have two qual there's two qualities that if they're not in a person, they won't have any portion of this knowledge. The first one is bid'ah. You have to have a, a sound belief, true belief, and you have to have um, sound practice. So if you have bid'ah in your belief or bid'ah in your practice, and then that's why it's important to learn fiqh, so you don't fall into, because bid'ah, a lot of people use that word, they throw it around, but they don't really understand it. And I think uh, in some of the other classes they might have talked about the different types. Sheikh Jamal, I think, is going to talk about that if he hasn't already, about the different types of bid'ah. So he's talking about bid'ah madhmuma, a, a, a unacceptable. And also he said, "Man kana muhibban dunya musirran ala hawa lam yatahqaq bihi, wa qad yatahqaq bi sa'ir al-'ulum wa qalu uqubti man yunkiruhu alla yursaq minhu shay'a." He said that whoever loves this world or follows his caprice, he'll never realize.
realize this knowledge, even if he realizes all the other knowledges. And, and the least of his punishment in rejecting it is that he won't be given any portion of it. And he says, this is the knowledge of the Siddiqeen and the Muqarrabeen, of the sincere ones like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the Muqarrabeen, this, this is the highest degree of wilaya, the ilm al-mukashifa. So here's what he says, all right, so now you're going to get what he, the, the most that he can say, because he says this book is not about mukashifa, he said it's not something you put in books, it's something that's experienced. But what he's going to say here is pretty much uh, all that he can say. He says, فَهُوَ عِبَارَةٌ عَنْ نُورٍ يَظْهَرُ فِي الْقَلْبِ عِنْدَ تَطْهِيرِهِ وَتَسْكِيَتِهِ مِنْ صِفَاتِهِ الْمَذْهُمَةِ It is, this what we call ilm al mukashifa is an expression that indicates a light in the heart, that manifests in the heart once it's been purified and removed of its negative qualities. And that light will uh, he said, So certain things are made clear because of that light. Just like light enables you to see things, that light in the heart enables you to perceive things. And so he says that uh, he says. فَيَتَوَهَّمُ لَهَا مَعَانِيَ مُجْمَلَةً غَيْرَ مُتَضِحَةٍ فَتَطَّدِحُ إِذْ ذَاكَ حَتَّى تَحْصُلُ الْمَعْرِفَةُ الْحَقِيقِيَةُ لِذَاتِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ And so, before you really know it, that people can say things, and they can have ideas of what these meanings are, just general ideas, but it's not clear to them. It only is clear when that true knowledge emerges about the, the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And understanding why he has done this world. You see, why he has done this. And this is why these people are, are in real submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a completely different way. Because they understand what's really going on. They understand this hikmah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in his creation. The wisdom behind these things. They understand these things. And so they don't get the confusion that people that don't have this uh, knowledge get. They don't have the same level of confusion because they see clearly that Allah is Rahman and Rahim. Everything He does is for the benefit of our uh, species. And He doesn't oppress us, we oppress ourselves. That we have free will and yet at the same time we, there, there is a type of determinism. And this is one of the paradoxes of our tradition that Imam Ali عنه, said, somebody asked him about that, and he told, he told he, about Qadr and the Ijbar and the Takhir, free choice. And, 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 and he told him, you know, lift, lift one leg, he lifted it. And he said, now lift the other without putting that down. He said, I can't. He said, it's between the two. So. That's one of Allah's secrets. But we've been told if you delve too deeply in that, it'll confuse you. But we believe that, that we are responsible for our actions, and, and yet our actions are purely enabled by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he says this also will give you an understanding of the nature of angelic forces and demonic forces, that there are light forces working in, in creation and dark forces. and and we want to accrue the madad, the help of the angelic forces. Dhikr does that, knowledge and learning does that. But we also want to avoid the, uh, the dark forces. And th so there's protection that you have to do in order to avoid these dark forces. So this is, this is very important. And these are the knowledges that come from that. Because there are shayateen al-ins and there are shayateen al-jinn. There, there are demons that are of jinn and ins. Well, insan. And then how shaitan is fighting the human being, the, the techniques that these demonic forces use. You get an understanding of that. Well, how the angels manifest to the prophets and how wahi comes to them. 
and understanding the nature of the heavenly kingdom, the nature of the heart, and then also how the angels and the shayateen themselves are in a, a conflict. So these positive forces and negative forces are working also. Ma'rifat al-farq bayna lammat al-marik wa lammat al-shaytan. Knowing the difference between demonic and angelic inspiration. Knowing what the akhir is. Understanding Jannah and Nar. Understanding the punishment of the grave. What the sirat is. What the mizan is. The, 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 the bridge. The balance. Also the hisab. The reckoning. Kafa bi nafsika al-yawma alayka hasiba. Today your nafs is your own uh, accountant. Right? Because you're going to see your whole life. I mean, now we have reality TV, we have all these things. People didn't have any idea of having a replay of their lives. <laughs> I mean, they were just told, you're going to see your life. It's literally, uh, Imam al ozai said, you will see your life moment by moment. Now we have, we have what's called editing discretion here. It's called Toba. So you can edit out things in, in this film that you're going to see. You don't want to see the, the director's cut, right? You want to see the edited version, right? Yes, yeah, Sato. So there's things you can edit out on this, but you are going to see your whole life. And this is what, what we were told. Tu'aradu. Alayya a'malu ummati. The actions of my ummah are shown to me. Subhanallah. The actions of my ummah are shown to me. فَإِذَا وَجَدْتُ خَيْرًا حَمِدْتُ اللَّهِ If I see good, I, I praise God. وَإِذَا وَجَدْتُ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ اسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَهُمْ And if I see other than that, I beg forgiveness of them. لَا تَوَاخِذْهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ The Prophet said that there was a, one of the Prophets covered in blood and he said about to, to the people that were punishing him, Oh God, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And that's what he said at Uhud. Forgive my people, they don't know what they're doing. He asked forgiveness, one of the pro problematic hadith of, for some of the ulama. He asked forgiveness of them. In other words, that Allah would give tawbah and, and bring them into the fold. So, those are all things that come from that. And then understanding these verses, وَإِنَّ دَارُ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيْوَانِ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ that the, the abode of the next world is the true life if they but knew th that this life will appear like a dream compared to, to, to the next world. We're going to remove, this is mukashifa in the next world. We're going to remove the veils. Your, your sight today is piercing. In the akhirah, you're going to see, it's all beneath, but there are people here that experience that. They see the reality of, of the world. It gets unveiled for them. They see the sicknesses in the world. They see what people are doing to themselves. And, 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 they, and, they, and their hallmark is compassion. They don't have ihtiqar. There's a lot of people that get unveilings, but they're not, they, don't, they're, they don't have the spiritual. They're not spiritual vessels for those unveilings. So they see the reality, the bovine nature of a lot of people. And they, and they make fun of them, they mock them, they become comedians, and they laugh at them. They mock them. They see, they're, they're, they have you know, intellects, and they look, and they see how stupid we are as a species. And, 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 and they use that as brunts for their jokes about people, the mustahzi'un. Right? Because people are. We're, we're a ridiculous species from one perspective. Other than the prophets and the, and the awliya, we're a ridiculous species. The things we fight over, our pettiness, our stupidities, our dysfunctionalities, all of these things. We, we're the brunt of jokes. But when you have the prophetic heart, when you have the heart of wilaya, you have compassion for these people. You want to elevate them from their bovine reality to a spiritual reality, to take them out of their inhum kal an'am. They're like cows. No, they're not cows. They're, they're, they're created in, in a metaphysical image of reality. They're created in the, in, in the form of, the, of a prophet, Adam alayhi salam. They have, they, they have the potential to have the light of, of iman, of faith and ma'rifa in their hearts. So this is, this is what he's saying. These are the realities. 
And so he says there's maqamat for all of this. And then he talks about how people involve themselves in fard kifayat, like learning fiqh uh, and other things when they don't fulfill the, the, uh, the fard ayn. So there's people that involve themselves, like they'll learn fiqh al-khilaf, but they don't know, so they'll learn about the differences of the fuqaha, but they don't know the basis of even one of the opinions. And, and so, so they, they put things, they put the cart before the horse. And he talks also about, um, he says, why do they learn these, the fiqh? Because they want to get, he said, they should be learning medicine. Because he said, we need, we, he said, we've got a lot of fuqaha, we don't have doctors. He's talking about in his time. He said, we have a lot of fuqaha, why are they all going to fiqh? And they, they're not, they're leaving medicine to the Christians and the Jews. Why? He said, because they want the awqaf. They want to be in charge of the awqaf. <laughs> You know, that they've got, they've got, they want to get, they're looking for, now they study medicine because that's the way you make money. Faqi, they're all poor now. So now they're all studying medicine. All our brilliant people in the Arab world and Muslim world, they're all studying medicine. No money in fiqh anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's the irony of, <laughs> yeah. And then he talks about wara, you know, but, but, now this is really important here because here's what he says. Hey hat hey hat. You know he says like, why don't they study uh, medicine, right? He said, but they want to get in charge of the orphans' wealth with the qalid al qada with hukuma and get into positions of like qadis in the government with taqaddum bihi ala al aqran with tasallut bihi ala al aada so that they can get ahead of their peers and then they can have some power over their enemies. Hey hats a hey hats. Yeah. Good luck. Qadin darasa ilmuddin bi tarbisi ulama asu. And this is one of his most important statements because I'm telling you he said this a thousand years ago. This religion has been corrupted by the the talbis of the, the bad ulama. They've dressed it and made it something other than it is. And we have the same problem today. All of these people uh, turning Islam into a political ideology that all, it's just about worldly power. These people that have no spiritual essence, which is what enables them to cut off heads with impunity. Or take uh, poor people that have been living for a thousand years amongst the Muslims unmolested and then drive them from their homes and what they don't read the eyes about being driven from the home what type of people drive people from their homes what kind of people are those that drive people from their lawful homes so all of that is gone and these people read the Quran they read the hadith the Prophet said it won't go down their throats it won't get to their hearts and he told us that these people were coming and he warned us about them and he said that they'll be eloquent. He said, when you see them pray, you'll, you'll can deem your prayer insignificant. He said, when you see them fast, you'll think you're fasting insignificant. So there are people that do worship and do... It's all outward. There's no inward reality. This is what he's talking about. These are sick people. And this is what he was fighting in his own lifetime. And if he was alive today, they, they, would, uh, they, they would be attacking him. Right? We, we can honor him now because it's a thousand years ago. Right? The only good saint is a dead saint. Right? When they're alive, it's, their life is tribulation. His life was filled with turmoil and tribulation. You know, assassination attempts. 
Subhanallah, his own teacher, there are several assassination attempts, you know, on these people. That they had terrorists, they were called the Hashashun, you know, the assassins. That they were at their time, his own patron, uh, Nidham al-Mulk, one of the great kings of, uh, he was a minister, but really one of the great rulers of our tradition. He was assassinated by one of these mad people. You know, this poor man that was here, uh, the foreign minister, he's had several assassination attempts. Because they're not good enough. Right? Not just enough. Everybody's a dhalim in their eyes, except themselves. They're not dhalim, but everybody else is a dhalim. Right? I'm, gonna set, I'm setting it straight. Inna nahnu musrihun. That's what they always say. We're setting things straight. They're the musidun. Ara innahum hum al musidun. They are the, the corruptors. They're the ones sowing corruption. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ If you say to them, don't sow corruption, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْرِحُونَ We're setting things right. أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمْ الْمُسْرِدُونَ No, they're corruptors. The Prophet ﷺ, they asked him, what do we do if we don't find it in the book and the sunnah? The Prophet said, سَلُوا الصَّالِحِينَ وَجَعَلُهُ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ Ask righteous people. People that have their nafs are purified. Ask those people. Don't ask the faqih. Right? Don't ask the faqih. In other words, this outward scholar that hasn't done anything to improve his own soul. Because they've got all the loopholes. Like they'll justify the most heinous crimes. They justify blowing up babies. Really. They use the hadith and the Qur'an to justify all their heinous crimes. They do. Because there's nothing there in the inward. There's no rahmah, there's no shafaqa, there's no musharaka wujdaniya like the Arabs say. Yeah. Imam Junaid rahimullah said that once Sariya Saqati was his uncle and also his spiritual teacher, he said to him, when you leave my gathering, who do you sit with? And he said, and muhasabi, harith and muhasabi. He said, فَقَالَ نَعَمْ خُذْ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ وَأَدَبِي وَدَعَنْكَ تَشْقِيقَهُ لِلْكَلَامِ وَرْضُهُ عَلَى الْمُتَكَلِّمِينَ Take from his knowledge and his adab. But leave his, uh, 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 some of the things that he says, his refutations uh, of the theologians and things. In other words, don't get involved in his polemics. And then he said to him, ثُمَّ لَمَّا وَلَّيْتْ سَمِعْتُ يَقُولْ جَعَلَكَ اللَّهُ صَاحِبَ حَدِيثٍ صُوفِيَّةٍ وَلَا جَعَلَكَ صُوفِيًّا صَاحِبَ حَدِيثٍ May God make you a, a traditionalist who happens to be a Sufi and not a Sufi who happens to be a traditionalist. A very important statement. أَشَارَ إِلَى أَنَّ مَنْ حَصَّلَ الْحَدِيثِ وَالْعِلْمَ ثُمَّ تَصَوَّفَ أَفْلَحَ and he's, he meant by this, if you learn outward knowledge and then you learn the inward knowledge, you will have success. But if you learn the inward knowledge, and then before you learn the outward knowledge, you're putting yourself in grave danger. Because it's easy to go astray. Shaitan can do lots of, play lots of games with you. But he can't play games with an alim, who's also an abid. He can't play games with them. But the abid who's not an alim, he can play games with them. And there are many hadiths to indicate that. And then he says, Why aren't you mentioning uh, dialectical theology and philosophy amongst these things, whether they're blameworthy or praiseworthy? And then he, so then he goes on, about, and there's a whole section about kalam. And he said, much of it is is unnecessary. People shouldn't involve themselves. He actually wrote a book, Il Jam al Awam, on Ilm al Karam. Preventing common people to get involved in dialectical theology. But he said it's necessary to fight obfuscations and these things. Uh, but he said some of it really doesn't have any relationship between the religion that's, that's sound. But about philosophy, and this is important. He says, philosophy is not a science in and of itself, but it has branches of science. 
One of them is, engineer, uh, is uh, geometry and mathematics. And this is what we call now theoretical mathematics, which is a type of philosophy. So he's saying that uh, they're permissible. And also they can go under the fard kifaya, because people need to know these things. So he mentions that. And then he says the next is logic. وَهُوَ بَحْثٌ عَنْ وَجْهِ الدَّرِيرِ وَشُرُوطِهِ وَوَجْهِ الْحَدِّ وَشُرُوطِهِ وَهُمَا دَاخِلَانِ فِي عِلْمِ الْكَرَامِ Logic, he argues, is a propedeutic knowledge. It's, it's a necessary introductory science to all the sciences. And he considered it very important. He wrote seven different treaties. He wrote five books on, on logic and a, a few treaties on it. So he considered it very, very important. He actually wrote one book. He removed all the... the traditional terminology just to make it a little more palatable to some of the fuqaha that didn't like the, the terminology of it. But he was a, a master logician and uh, it enabled him obviously to win all the debates that he got into. But uh, he recognized the importance. He considered it to be like grammar for the, the mind. It's, it's the rules of syntax for thinking. Uh, and then the ilahiyats, and he said this is concerns uh, metaphysics, theology, um, and he said uh, they have a lot of different madhabs. He said some of it is kufr, some of it is bid'ah. He actually identifies in maqasid 20 positions, three of them he considered kufr, uh, 17 he considered to be bid'ah. Um, and then the fourth, and this is important, are the tabi'iyat, and these are what we would call today natural sciences. Because traditionally, natural sciences went over under the category of philosophy. So natural sciences were part of philosophy in the past, which is why a lot of people uh, look askance at philosophy, uh, because a lot of the philosophers were very wrong about their scientific conclusions about the world. Uh, Aristotle makes egregious mistakes. but because of their flaws in natural philosophy, they reject ethics, for instance, or uh, logic. And, and these, these are mistakes. So he, uh, he, he says something very important. Some of these sciences go against the religious truths. And this is important because natural sciences are sometimes in, in, in real conflict with revelation. And this is why it's very important to be careful with these things, because natural sciences are attempts to understand the world. These attempts often involve cosmology. I'll give you an example. One of, one of my sons was studying biology, and, and the, his biology teacher started talking about where everything's created from. In other words, he went from biology to cosmology. Instead of sticking with biology, which is the science of living things, he moved to the science of being, which is ontology, cosmology. This is a whole other branch. But philosophers like Dawkins is a, philo is a, a biologist. But very often scientists, because they recognize how insignificant their knowledge truly is in relation to the big questions of existence, they often have this impulse or urge to engage in metaphysics and philosophy, even though they're not trained in these subjects. But they're clever people, they read books, uh, and so they begin to uh, espouse positions about the world, where it came from. Biology is very different. So this is, uh, this is important to note that a lot of their cosmological conclusions are simply false. For instance, they don't, they don't believe uh, in a creator God, most of these cosmologists. They say that if the Big Bang occurred, then there's probably alt alternate universes. So it's just a universe begetting another universe. That's a pure conjecture. And, and then they have magical formulas they put on the board, you know, they write all those magical formulas. You see pictures of Einstein, and it's all magic, gibberish. You know gibberish? You know gibberish, where that comes from? It comes from Jabir bin Hayyan. Because when Jabir's books reached Europe, they, they couldn't understand them, so they called it gibberish. You know? um, that's true etymology. 
So, so, so they put up all these things, and of course you don't understand. There's only 15 people on the planet that can understand them, right? And, and but he's saying, oh, here, this ha this is this can happen in quantum physics. Things can just pop into existence. We didn't show them the creation of the heavens and the earth. We didn't even show them their own creation. You weren't around when your zygote got out of control. Right? You weren't around. You weren't consciously experienced those mitotic cell divisions in the womb of your mother. Right? Allah didn't even show you your own creation and yet you're going to philosophize about His creation. Right? He didn't show, we weren't there at the singularity. We weren't there at the Big Bang. It's all, the, 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 these are conjectures. And this is the arrogance of human beings. Right? This is the, the arrogance of human beings, that the intellect can take you to all knowledge. And that's why they're waiting to discover these things. You know, like the, the biologists, they met with God, and they asked him what they were up to. He said, well, we've got rid of you. He said, how'd you do that? He said, well, we showed how you can get life without you. He said, well, how'd you do that? He said, well, first we take some cosmic dust. And God said, wait a second, hold on. Get your own dust. <laughs> so that's the difference between cosmology and biology. Right? Where did matter come from? Even if you determine that life uh, came from some comet that landed on Earth with some... Right, in some, they, they call it, what do they call that swamp? Uh, the primordial soup, right? And then also the whole, I mean, anyway, there's a, there's a lot of problems. So just he's pointing that out, that they have problems. And, and for Muslims, there's a difference between science and scientism. To scientism. And I'll just show you from a, a Venn diagram for people, say Tunis students should know this, right? Ahmed, go. You did Venn, didn't you? Did you do the Venn diagram? So, you know, Venn diagrams are ways of understanding um, logical positions, but if you, if you look at, here's the circle, this is truth. And then this circle is belief. Not all things that we believe are true, right? And there's a lot of truth out there that we have not discovered. But what we call knowledge is where truth and belief correspond. That's true knowledge. And, and when you get into epistemology, you have what's called justified true belief, right? So you have a proposition. Uh, yesterday, uh, Erdogan won the presidency of the AK party, right? Okay, so I believe that. M my belief is justified because I was in Turkey I saw all those blaring horns. I saw pictures everywhere of Erdogan, you know, running for president. And, and I read in the newspaper that he won with a 52% lead or something like that. So I have a justified true belief. So it's true, I believe it, and they correspond. And, and this is our traditional understanding of, of truth. Muslims adhere to what's called the correspondence theory of truth. It's no longer really accepted in, in Western uh, epistemology. They don't, they don't believe it after Kant, and Kant called his whole revolution the Copernican revolution of epistemology. He, he turned everything upside down. People don't believe these things anymore. But we actually believe that God uh, gave us intellects that correspond with the world he created. That there's a correspondence between our intellects and the world. And so there's a reality out there, and there's a concept of a reality that in, is in here, and it corresponds. It doesn't mean we can't be fooled. We can, and Allah has told us that. We can be fooled. We can have beliefs that do not correspond with reality, and we can be justified in believing them up to a certain point. Like, for instance, the geocentric 
model would survive for many, many centuries because it made sense. And we still don't, we don't talk about earth turns. What a beautiful earth rise, uh, earth spin. You know, nobody says that. We talk about sunrise, moonrise. We don't say, oh, amazing earth spin this morning. <laughs> nobody says that. Why? Because you can't experience the movement of the earth. But we have enough, there's a lot of evidence, even though uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking in his own book said there's still valid perspectives. He actually said that in, his, in the last book he wrote that the Ptolemaic worldview, it's still a sound position. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that it's not the way things are actually happening. Even though we don't experience it that way, we still experience a geocentric world. That, that's the way Allah has made it. So it's fitra to experience a geocentric world, but that doesn't mean that that's what corresponds with reality. And, and the Muslims had an interesting distinction between what they called sharia and haqiqa. Uh, so traditionally they differentiate between sharia knowledge and haqiqa, real reality. And, and the sharia, for instance, in sharia, God speaks to us from a geocentric perspective. He talks about the sun rising, when the sun reaches the 90 point, that's when we pray. So that's sharia. It, it doesn't necessarily mean it's... I mean, if we took all these modern sciences, we know that the sun if you see it on the horizon, eight minutes after it's set, it's still on the horizon, right? So if you, if you went by haqiqa, it's already set, but you can't break your fast eight minutes early. <laughs> I just put something out there, there's a no, I think you can. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't break your fast eight minutes early. Even though we know the sun's already actually set, but that's the time it took, 92 million miles away, the sun. That's the time going at 186,000 miles per second. That's the time it took the light to get here. It took eight minutes. So the sun's already gone down. By Sharia, we, we ignore that fact. Right? That's considered pretty much factual by science. We ignore that. So that's very important that, that he points that out. And, and then he says that these physicists are like doctors, only the doctor is considered with the motion of the body and how it's sick and how it's well. Whereas they look at all bodies and look at it from the perspective of, of change and motion, right? Which is what calculus, I mean, this is the science of studying change and motion, acceleration, how, how things change as they move, right? Uh, and so he says, He's saying there's no, there's no real need for it. Now you don't need it to, to have a healthy society, but it, it improves and it also harms life. So it has benefits and it has harms. I mean, modern, all these modern sciences have brought great benefit to human beings, but they've also brought great tribulations and in some ways brought us on to the drink, brink of uh, environmental disaster and psychological disaster. I mean, people, emotional meltdowns, people aren't doing very well. So now, um, and then he talks about that the Sahaba were ulama of the Akhirah. They weren't ulama of the dunya. And he said the Prophet ﷺ had all, he left behind all of these great knowledgeable scholars of the Akhirah. And yet he said, if you look at the reality of it, here, he says here, that the Prophet ﷺ left alaf min al sahabati radiallahu kullahum ulama ubillah. All of them were Gnostics of God. They all knew God. Athna alayhim Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he praised them. Walam yukum fihim ahdun yuhsinu sunat al kalam. They didn't. They weren't uh, good at writing. They didn't leave books behind. Walam yunasib nafsuhu lil fatwa. None of them set themselves up as muftis. In fact. He said there, there's only less than 10 that were giving fatwa 
Out of all these thousands, tens of thousands of Sahaba, there's less than 10 that were giving fatwa. And Muktirun are less than 10. Aisha is one of them. Really, they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't going... In fact, when people came to them for fatwa, they would say, go ask so-and-so. They didn't want to answer. And he said, كان إذا سئل عن الفتوى يقول لساء إذهب إلى هذا الأمير الذي تقلد أمور الناس Go to this Amir, go to the ruler that's in charge of the affairs of people and وضعها في عنقه Put it in his, around his neck. I don't want the responsibility. Put it around his neck. إشارة إلى أن الفتوى في القضايا والأحكام من توابع الولاية والسلطنة. This is a clear indication that these are the affairs of state. See, now we've got all these nut cases giving their fatwas, right, out there. They're all giving fatwas. You know, go kill these people, go kill these people, go blow up these people. Who are these people? On whose authority? Right? Whose authority are, are, are you issuing these fatwas? But this is the problem when we have religious anarchy. We have religious anarchy now. He said they weren't interested in shuhra, in being famous. They weren't interested in winning arguments. He said Abu Bakr is not, his fame is not because he was the caliph. He said, we know about him because of a secret that God put in his heart. Omar <laughs> he said he was known for his siyasa, but look at his bounty and knowledge. When he died, Ibn Mas'ud said nine-tenths of knowledge went with him. And somebody said to him, there are plenty of Ulama and fuqaha, how could you say that? He said, no, he's taken knowledge of God with him. And then he says, the fuqaha and the mutakalimun, jurists and theologians, and then the khulafa, the qadat, the ulama, he said, they, they go into different categories. He said, some of them, they actually desire God for their knowledge and their fatwa, and they're defending the sunnah. But other ones are just out for fame and notoriety and reputation. He said, not every action is knowledge. He said, the tabib, the, the doctor, can get close to God through his knowledge. If he's doing it for the right reason. If, he, if he's taking care of people for the sake of God. And he said, the sultan also has that. He can be pleasing to God. And he said, and so if you want to know the ways to get to God, there's three ways. Ilmun mujarradun, pure knowledge. And this is, he said, this is ilmun mukashifa. And this is very interesting because what he's saying, and this is something modern Muslims have no understanding of this. It's the gift of presence. It's the gift of being. There are people that their gift is simply their presence. And, and in our tradition we've always had contemplatives. People that have lived a contemplative life and, and have not been active in worldly affairs. One of my own teachers, Marab Tarhaj, he left the world. He actually fled a town um, I mean, he was raised a Bedouin, but he fled a town because he thought there was so much corruption. And when I went to that town, I, th I felt like I was in Medina in the 8th century. It was so amazing. Every night it was just, all you could hear was the Qur'an. Like, Dawi and nahl literally. I, I'm not romanticizing Gero. I mean, I, I saw it with my own eyes. Literally, we sat up on the... At night, I used to go up after, after Isha. And we would go up on a, a sand dune. And there was no electricity, so the, all you could see was some candlelight in some of the houses. There was no electricity, it was all mud houses. There was no pollution, couldn't see any litter. The whole town, all you could hear was Qur'an. It was amazing. I mean, I cried several times just looking at it, just thinking, what is this place? 
That's gone. If you go there now, all the houses are made out of cement. Um, there's garbage everywhere. There's all these telephone wires everywhere, the satellite dishes everywhere, and at night they're all watching satellite TV. It happened in my lifetime. I saw it with my own eyes. Amazing. But Murab Tarhaj left that place because he thought it was too corrupt for him. <laughs> and he went to a very hard place to get to. And when I got there, one of the first things he told me, he said, I put a barrier between me and the people of Dunya. So, he said, people of Himma get to this place. But he's pure contemplative, but he taught. I mean, that's action in that he was a great teacher. And many, many people, uh, I mean, literally thousands of people studied with him over his, because he taught for about 90 years, I think, close to. But his great gift was his presence, not just his knowledge, just to sit and be in the presence of a human being that had conquered his nafs and was a true servant of God. So that's one type of knowledge. وَعَمْنُ مُجَرَّدٌ And then pure action. وَهُوَ كَعَدْرَ السُّلْطَانِ مَثَلًا وَضَبْدِهِ لِلنَّاسِ I once went to... Uh, Sheikh Sultan Al Qasimi's uh, uh, palace in um, in Sharjah, and I was with another um, one of the duat, and 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 I've been in several of these type places, but there was definitely a palpable sakina there, you know. And I remember I said to uh, I said to the person I was with, I said, Subhanallah, there's a sakina here, like tranquility, and he said, Naam dhikrullah. And I said, I don't think so. I think it's justice. Because the dhikr of the sultan is being a just ruler, not being unjust. That's the dhikr of a sultan. You don't want a sultan that's... You know, Imam al-Ghazali, one of the sultans at the end of his life came to study with him. He said, no, you go and do your work. Don't, you're, you're not supposed to be here. This is not... Go and do your work. Take care of the poor people. Help the oppressed people. Help the... Do those things. That's what the Sultan is supposed to be doing. So he's saying that people of action, that, that, that's, that's a life. And, and they could do that. And then he said, and then murakabun min idman wa amal. And this is, he said, this is the highest. Because the, he said, huwa ilm tariq al akhirah. This is really the best, those who join knowledge and action. And he said, these are the ulama wal ummal, the people that have knowledge. And, and Murab Tarhaj is really from that because he did, that, that's what he did his whole life was teach. And so he said, look at yourself. And who do you want to be in? Which hizb do you want to be in on the day of judgment? Which group do you want to be in? And then he talks, he goes on and he talks about the Imams, and it's very important. Like he talks about all these Imams, the four Imams, and he shows how they were ulama of akhirah. They had secrets. They weren't these dry uh, people. That they were, they were people of deep knowledge of Allah. He talks, he begins with Imam Shafi'i, that's his Imam. Then he goes to Imam Malik, and then he goes to Imam Abu Hanifa to show that these, and then Imam Ahmad and, and Sufyan also. Um, and so that's the second book that he does. And so any questions? I, I spent more time on that because it's really, that's one of the core books to, to understand. Um, the other ones, we're going to be able to get through them quicker, inshallah. What book do you recommend to learn the temperaments and the foods related to them? There's a good book called The Temperament God Gave You, because the Catholics still have this tradition, even though they got it from us. Because um, they, they translate all those Arabic books. Because Ibn Sina really developed this, and then it got into the Arabic tradition. I mean, his book was taught in Europe for centuries. So the Catholics believe in this temperaments. Uh, can you please elaborate on what Ghazali says about how learning inward knowledge prior to the outward can lead you astray? Well, there's a lot of 
You know, Imam Malik did not like to be asked about gharib al-ilm. And the Prophet ﷺ, a man once asked him about the sa'a. And he didn't say anything. And later he asked about, where's the man asking him about the, uh, about the end of time? And the man said, it was me. He said, Mada a'dad salaha? What have you prepared for it? Right? In other words, that's more, we know it's coming. That we know. We have certainty about that. There are signs. The Prophet told us about the signs. But the real matter is, is the readiness is all, as Hamlet says. To be prepared for death, that's, that's the purpose. Because the end of time really is your, the end of your life. And we don't know when that's coming. So the man said, I didn't prepare a lot of prayer and fasting. He said, I, I only, The only thing I have is love for you and love for Allah. And the Prophet said, A man's with the one he loved. That's why I don't underestimate mahabba if it's real, if it's genuine. And, and Anna said, We were overjoyed with that more than anything we'd heard. So that's, that's important. Um, any other questions? Assalamualaikum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mentioned that traditionally uh, a sheikh was um, a psychologist. Yeah. I just want to ask, is there benefit in studying modern psychology and say NLP techniques to treat problems in our communities like addiction, depression? And if there, so, yeah. is this like a fad kifaya? There's definitely, a, I think, a lot of knowledge. There, a lot of, I mean, unfortunately, they've studied human beings so well. You know who hires psychologists uh, are advertising agencies. So social engineering is real, and that came from really, they understand the self. But they, they have a materialistic understanding of the self, which is different from our understanding. So there's, there's problems with the, you know, one of the things that Muslims, that we have to do is we have to learn our tradition, and this is a double burden. This is what Imam al-Ghazali did. He learned, he not only knew his tradition, he also knew the other tradition. He knew comparative religion. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a multi-volume work on Christianity. And one of the things that Ibn, and he, he shows how the Bible predicted the Prophet. He showed uh, a lot of, it's a very interesting work. One of the things he says in the first volume of that work, he said, you know, Muslims, when Christians ask them questions, they say, لا نعطيك الجواب إلا سيف. The answer we're going to give you is the sword. He said, what is that? He said, that's the very thing they say about our religion. Like, that's why they don't want to join it. <laughs> he, said, <"You're> just <laughs> he said, you're just confirming their stereotype. He said, our religion, he said, He said, our religion spread with, with proofs and, 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 and clarification, not with, with uh, oppressing people with the sword. He said, what's wrong with Muslims? He said, they should learn. And, 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 and discuss with people that our way is the way of persuasion. It's not the way of, you know, if you don't like what I have, you know, I'll just punch you in the face. What is that? Blood is no argument, Shakespeare says. It's no argument. You don't want to argument by killing somebody. You know, we have this problem in our community. It was a, I mean, it's been acknowledged. Ibn Taymiyyah recognized it. And some of these people that call themselves his followers, you know, are, are some of the worst. It's criminals. What is the second of the two things if one has he would, good catch? Because I didn't mention it, did I? Good catch. Kibar, arrogance. If you have arrogance, Bid'ah or arrogance? He said, these two things, the heart will, it's just not open to illumination. Can you repeat the three ways to get to God? W what he said is that you can have pure knowledge, which is contemplation, you know, to, where, where you really come to know God through contemplation, meditation, 
Um, and then action, so you have an activist life. It has to be guided by knowledge, but you have an activist life. You're out doing things in the world, setting up orphanages, taking care of people, um, right? A governor, a ruler. Rulers, we want good rulers. This whole idea of, we want people like that, and, and we should pray for them and support them, like the, the uh, Dawud Alu, you know, Erdogan. They're politicians, and they're in complex societies. So there's always going to be, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to have problems. They're not going to please everybody. They're, they're going to do things uh, that might not have been the wisest thing to do. Sometimes you're going to have oppression. The Prophet ﷺ said that uh, Najashi was a just ruler. And yet we know from the hadith there were people that were, were oppressed. One of the Sahaba mentioned that they saw a woman knocked over carrying an old woman, carrying a jar. And she got knocked over by some bullies. So in every country you're going to have people that are wronged, and then you're going to have people that have grievances, legitimate or perceived. There's people uh, in this country that want secession, right? The Kurdish people were victims of colonization because they, they were put into all these different countries and, and the borders before they moved very freely. Uh, Kurdistan was... But now there's problems because of these um, borders that were um, demarcated. Because the Ottoman Empire, which was not a Turkish Empire per se, it was a multicultural, multi-ethnic multi civilization, and the rulers were not Turks. Uh, towards the latter period of the time, they had more European blood than they had Turkish blood. It's a well-known fact. Uh, and then joining the two are people that have solid knowledge and people that are people of action as well. And those are people, he's, I mean, that's the preferred position to join the two. That's the Prophet's sunnah. But Awais al-Qarni retreated from the world. At the end of his life, he came out and he actually did do some things. But generally, he was a contemplative. Um, and then there are other people, people of action, uh, although he had a considerable amount of knowledge, um, he was a man of action, somebody like um, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. You know, he's got his faults, but he was definitely a great man, nobody can deny that. Time is up. All right, alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, the next two will be quick. So we'll get through this, inshallah, bi'idnillah. But I wanted you to really have a good understanding of what he was talking about. Uh, all right. Subhanakallahumma yahamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruku wa tubu ilayk. Takallah khairan. Just quick before we pray, those people who are planning on fasting tomorrow, there will be suhoor available in the cafeteria starting at 3.30 a.m. And uh, for people who sign in for appointments with Dr. Yang, once you get back, you'll find them posted out on one sheet outside of the office, and I'll be there if you have any questions. Try to find your name and, and mark it down, and if you don't see it there and you signed up, then please see me. Thank you very much.